Thank you, Nick, for the scripture reading, and thank you, Harold, for leading that song. What song was that? Make Me a Servant. Did you mean it when you sang it? It was a prayer, wasn't it? Lord, make me a servant. Make me like you. To think about being servants as Jesus was a servant boggles the mind. Because when you read through the Gospels, that's all he did. He was continually serving. And yet that's what he teaches us to do. And he also teaches us that there is a great joy to be had in serving. Look at Mark chapter 9. Back up a little bit uh, from chapter 10 to, to, to chapter 9. We'll start here and we'll, we'll wind up in 10 in just a minute. But I want you to see that what Jesus was saying there in Matthew chapter or Mark chapter 10 didn't, didn't start there, but started earlier. Mark chapter 9. Verse 33. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing along the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. What in the world were they discussing? Well, they were discussing who was the greatest. So Jesus asked them, what was it you were talking about? Why did they keep silent? I think they knew him well enough to know he would not approve of that kind of a discussion. Unless the discussion was something like, you're the greatest. No, you're the greatest because you've all done these things and encouraged people. Oh, no, but you're the greatest because you've taught this lesson and you've done that and you've been over there ministering and... Now, if that was the way the discussion went, do you think they would have kept silent? I think they would have said, oh, Jesus, I was trying to tell Peter what a great apostle he is. And I think they would have owned up to that. But what they were doing was, well, you know what they were doing. So what does he do? Verse 35, sitting down, he called the twelve. Now, what's that mean? He sits down. When he sits down, come over here, guys. We've got to have a little talk. We've got to have a little powwow. Huddle. What's this going to be about, Jesus? Well, I think you know what it's going to be about. Anybody who wants to be first, where's he going to wind up? Last. Takes a child, and he sets that child in front of them, putting that child in his arms. And he says to them, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. Do you receive children? you love kids? The innocence of children is beautiful. The purity of children is, pu is beautiful. They haven't yet become what we are. Isn't that marvelous? We need to protect that as long as we can. Jesus says, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. So when you welcome a child, Jesus is saying you're really welcoming God. But what do you have to do to welcome a child? Well, you've got to humble yourself. Because we're big people. We're important people. We don't have time for those little kids. Their mama needs to wipe their nose. Well, don't you have a Kleenex? Doesn't stop here. Chapter 10. Verse 35. By the way, should it have stopped there? We know it should have stopped there, but it didn't stop there. Mark 10, 35. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, come up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now just stop right there. Doesn't that sound just a little bit audacious? We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Oh, sure. Anything you ask. Whoa. Come on, guys. This is, this is James and John. He said to them, 
what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? Listen to this. They say to him, we are able. The audacity has not ended, has it? <laughs> These guys are just thinking a little bit too highly of themselves, it would appear. Jesus said, the cup that I drink, you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. Do you think they had any idea what that meant? We know, we have the benefit now of being able to look back and say, wow, those guys were really dumb. Why is this in here except for me to look at myself and ask myself, am I being like them sometimes? But to sit on my right hand and my left, Jesus says, it's not mine to give, but it's for those whom it, for whom it has been prepared. And hearing this, the request that James and John were making, and as a matter of fact, if you go back and you read Matthew's account, their mom was also involved in this. Their mom's coming. She wants this for them. They want it for themselves. So the other guys hear what's going on, and they began to feel indignant with James and Now, why were they feeling indignant with James and John? I know this calls for speculation, but do you suppose it was because, well, you're taking glory that the Lord should have. You're taking the, the place that, that God should only be allowed to be given. Why do you think they're indignant? Going back to chapter 9, I'm kind of thinking, and you might disagree with me on this, which is fine. You can be wrong if you want to. <laughs> but, but I'm kind of thinking they're saying, I want that place. I should have that place. After all, in our discussion about who is the greatest, you see where this is going with these guys? Verse 42. Calling them to himself. Does that sound familiar? Huddle up, guys. We're going to call the same play we did before. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your, and there it is, servant. Whoever wants to be great, you got to be a servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. Oh, servant, maybe, Lord, but slave, ah, oh, that just digs too deep. And then Jesus says this, verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So who does he hold up as the example? Himself. Jesus doesn't ask us to do one single thing. Not one thing does God want us to do that he hasn't done through Jesus to give us an example to follow. For 33 years, he lived among human beings. And I don't know that much about the first 30 years because the Gospels get into it when he begins his ministry. But I really doubt there's much difference between his character and his virtue and his heart and his compassion. between those first 30 years and the, and the last three. And those last three we see in the Gospels, how he reached out to people, how he touched people, how people heard him teach, and they said, he's not teaching like the scribes and the Pharisees, but he teaches as one who has authority, one who has power. Jesus lowered himself. He came down from heaven. Came down from heaven to serve us. Not just to come down and die in an instant and go back up, but he came down to live for 33 years in time, as we understand time. And he dealt with sin, as we understand sin, and temptation, as we understand temptation. And even dealing with all of that, he served the entire time he served. I don't know how he did it, honestly. You read through the Gospels and you read about how the crowds were pressing on him constantly and, and he tried to get away for a little bit of, of respite a little bit of rest, a little bit of a break, what would they do? They'd come find him. And when they found him, what did he do? He served. He served. This hits hard. Do you like to serve or do you like to be served? Now there's a little bit of give and take in that. I, I understand that. 
But Jesus is calling us not to be served, but to serve. He's calling us to reach out. He's calling us to humble ourselves. He's calling us to find those areas in life where we can make a difference and then to try to make a difference right there. Three things servants do, I think. I think servants look for a way to serve. They don't stand around waiting for somebody to show them a way to serve. They look for a way to serve. And there are all kinds of ways to serve. Servants also serve without being asked. They see something that needs doing, they just go and they try to do it. If they've got the ability to do it, they don't wait to receive authority or to be given permission. They just go do it. I think that's what servants do. I think they've got that kind of a heart and that kind of a mind because servants, service has become ingrained in their thinking. And that's what God wants us to do, to get it ingrained in our thinking. Where we're not fighting about who's going to be the greatest, we are serving and in our respective places and with our respective gifts, we're serving. And that's another thing that maybe we ought, to, we ought to mention from time to time is, though we each have our gifts, I don't think our service should be limited strictly to our gifts. I don't know what you think about that. But I, I really can't see Jesus being asked to do something or finding an opportunity for something to be done and for Jesus to say, oh no, that's not my gift. Of course, he probably had a few more gifts than we do. Yet he served. In every possible capacity we find him, he served. Another thing servants do is they refuse to count themselves too good to serve. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm above that. I'm too good for that. I got a pet peeve. I might have mentioned it to some of you before. Public bathrooms. Something about a public bathroom. When it's initially cleaned, there really is no reason whatsoever for it to ever need to be cleaned again. I mean, if you stop and think about it. If you go in and you use a public bathroom, how much time does it take to leave it clean for the next person? when you're done. Doesn't take that much time, does it? If you're thinking like that, if you're thinking, there's somebody coming to use this after me, I think I'll leave it clean for them. It wasn't a mess when I came in. Okay, now remember, we said, we said initially when it's cleaned, but how much time does it take to leave it clean for the next person? Somebody says, Marty, what's wrong with you talking about public worship? I think that's a reflection of an attitude. I think it's a reflection of a spirit. When we are willing to say to ourselves, I'm going to think about the next person, and I'm just going to take a minute, and I'm going to make sure that this is going to be nice for the next person. I think that's a spirit of service. I, I really believe that's a spirit of service because I've gone to public restrooms, and they weren't very nice. Any amens? There was somebody out there who wasn't thinking about you. Somebody out there didn't care about you. And I really believe if Jesus went to a public restroom, well, I'm just saying if I needed to go after him, I'd want to go to the same stall. Because I think I wouldn't have to do anything to make it ready if Jesus had been in there first. That was Jesus. That was his heart. That was his spirit. If you go to John chapter 13, perhaps there's no greater text in all of the New Testament than John chapter 13 when it comes to serving. And remember what we've just looked at in Mark. Mark chapter 9, the disciples, the apostles are having this discussion about who's going to be the greatest. And they know better because when Jesus asks them what they're talking about, they don't want to tell him. Oh, no, no, no. Same thing happens in chapter 10. James and John come up, and they've got the audacity to ask for the best places in the kingdom. We want to sit on your right and your left, and the other guys are upset about that, almost certainly because they don't want them to get something above them. And Jesus calls them again to sit down and talk about that. Well, here we are, John chapter 13, and, and unless you're familiar with, with John's gospel and his account and, and how he goes about covering the facts of Jesus' life and especially the last week or so of his life, you won't realize that John chapter 13 is, is right before Jesus is going to be arrested. 
very soon before that. So it says, chapter 13, verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to see the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Now, I don't know about you, but at this point in the reading, almost every time I want to say, Peter, shut up. Just sit down and shut up. <laughs> I love Peter, don't you? One of the reasons I love Peter is because I think I have some of those characteristics. I want to jump in and I want to, I want to make it better. Oh, well, let's make some adjustments here. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's talking to God come down to live in the flesh among men. He's talking to somebody who never makes mistakes, and Peter ought to know that by now. And when Peter is told by Jesus, what I'm doing, you won't understand, Peter ought to say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, I won't understand this. Let me just sit back here humbly and let you do what you need to do, and, and then I'll learn from this. But that's not Peter. He's going to jump on ahead. He's going to get in there first. You remember reading about, about the resurrection day when the women came and told Peter and John, the Lord's risen. Well, they took off running. John was faster, though. John got to the tomb first, but John didn't go inside. And here comes old slow Peter. But he runs right past John, right into the tomb. you got to love this guy. And so here he is, Jesus is trying to wash his feet, and he's having a fight with Peter to get him to let him wash his feet. Anyway, verse 12. When he'd washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? Boy, there's a question. Now, if I'd have been there, I'd have probably said, Well, duh, didn't he wash our feet? I think he washed our feet. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. He washed our feet. Was that the point? Have clean feet? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If then, if I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. And truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. What's Jesus saying of himself? He's saying he's a slave. He's saying he, he's a servant. And he's slaving for these guys, serving these guys. And he's giving this foot washing as an example of how to serve. He's not giving us this so that we can, without any meaning whatsoever, wash somebody else's feet. I don't know if you've ever seen that done, but there's not much need for foot washing in our day and age. I know there are the exceptions, but for the most part, we, we come in with pretty clean feet. It wasn't so in this day. You wore your sandals or perhaps no shoes at all. Whatever you had probably didn't keep your feet that clean. And most of the roads were dusty and dirty. They weren't paved. So you'd, you'd be walking on a hot day. You'd be sweaty. You'd get dirt on your feet. You'd come in. You'd take your shoes off. Man, you got those dirty old nasty feet. Let's get those things washed. Besides just the cleanliness aspect of it, how refreshing would it be to come in from a hot day into a room, there's no air conditioning, well, let's put your feet in some cool water and get them cleaned up, and that way we can all sit around the table with clean feet. Won't that be much nicer? That's what it was like then. And so service was required to some degree just to get those feet clean. And Jesus comes into this assembly, and what have they already been arguing about? But who's the greatest? And he's had to call them down twice for that, show them a little child, and show them the first is going to be last, the last is going to be first. You want to be great in the kingdom? What do you do? You serve. He puts on a towel. He gets a basin of water. He goes to each apostle, including whom? Including Judas. And he washes their feet. And he gets done with that, and he says, Do you know what I've done to you? And those guys, they had to know that this was a loaded question. Oh, man. I feel a lesson coming on. 
And sure enough, there is. But it's not a long lesson. The lesson was already made in what Jesus had done. He just had to explain what it was all about. What I really love, though, is verse 17. After he's washed their feet, we might think, well, what a menial task. He washed their feet, taught them to do the same. He says in verse 17, if you know these things, you are, fill in the blank, blessed if you do them. If you know how to serve and you serve, blessed are you in your service. Have you found a way to serve? You probably have. You might not even recognize that you found a way to serve. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 25. This is a text that I hope is very familiar to, to you. I, I know I've touched on it several times. I think the points that are made here, to be made here, are just so profound. At least they are for me, because this is the last day. This is not just the last day. This is the last hour. This, if you will, is the last moment of time, standing before God. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on the left. Now I want you to consider this. When it says all the nations, it's not just talking about all the nations of the world today and all the people alive today. But He's talking about every single individual who has ever lived from any nation now in existence or that's ever existed. Every single human being will be before the great throne. Isn't that a fantastic thought just to consider that from all time, all the way back to the creation. We're all going to be there. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent, and get this part, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. Even to the least of of them, even to the least of them. You remember what Jesus did when they were having that discussion about who was the greatest? He brought the little child and he, he embraced that little child and he said, you've got to humble yourself to be like this child and receive this child. And when you receive, there's that child right there. And who wouldn't hold a little child like that and just be thrilled with the prospect? Just to feel that, that tenderness and that warmth. And Jesus says, if you'll receive a little child like this, who are you receiving? Receiving God. And this is the proof of it. God, he's, he's on his throne and all the nations from all time are gathered before him. And he says, you served me when you went to prison and visited those in prison. You served me when you found somebody hungry, even though he was one of the least of your brethren. You fed him. You served me. You fed me when you did that. You gave one of the least of your brethren something to drink and you clothed him. Every time you do something for someone else, there might not be any trumpets going off, might not be any, any horns blowing, you might not get your name put in the paper, but when you do something for somebody else, that's exactly what God is talking about here. And that's what Jesus was talking about to the apostles. Serving, serving, serving. Now there's, a, there's another side to this. We're not done with this account before the great white throne. Verse 41, then he will say also to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, accursed ones, let that sink in, accursed ones, into eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Who are these accursed ones? Are they the murderers and the rapists? Are they the pillagers and the thieves and the backstabbers? Are they the abusers of other people? Who are they? Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. Naked 
and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. We're the, we're the murderers and the rapists and the torturers and the, we're all... Jesus says, you had opportunities to serve and you didn't serve. And for that you are accursed. And they're going to answer him in verse 44. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison? Did not take care of you. And he's going to answer them. Truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And so it works both ways. We see one of those who we might consider least important, some, quote, insignificant person. But they're in need. And so we serve. Or we some, see somebody and, and we think they're insignificant. And because they're insignificant, I'm not going to serve. I'm going to wait for somebody important to serve. Just listen to that. <laughs> I'm not going to serve until I find somebody important to serve. Where's the heart there? Where's the heart there? Verse 45. Then he will answer them. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment. Eternal punishment. Why? In this context, Jesus says these are accursed and they go into eternal punishment because they did not serve. How many of you want to run out of here right now and find some way to serve? Oh man, let's get out. Let's find a way to serve right now, quick, before the Lord comes back. Hey, listen, the fact that you're here... You're serving. What was Mike's lesson about in Bible class this morning? We worship God because He is worthy of being worshipped. He's worthy of being served. Of course, He commands it. And after we follow through with that command, we realize there's something to this. More than what we had, had figured out. More than what we could have reasoned out. That's why Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We do them when we find out this is the way to live. The way to live is not to sit back and wait to be served. The way to live, to find joy, to find peace, to find fulfillment, is to serve. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. That's what it says. This congregation has all kinds of ministries. You can, you can find the list. You know, there's, there's a card ministry. There's a ministry for preparing meals for when there is a funeral. There's a blood drive going on right now. Some of you have changed your ministry and become involved in that ministry. And when there's a blood drive, somebody needs to provide food, so there's food brought in. Almost everything that this congregation does is, is a ministry in one kind of another. We've got a pantry, and I, I don't know if, if Lloyd and Judy need any help or if Brian and Linda need any help, but those are two couples that are involved in that ministry. Did you know that every Sunday, Jason Smith, he's going to be embarrassed for me to mention his name, but Jason goes off and takes communion to shut-ins. And it takes him several hours to do that every Sunday. That's a service that we could help him with. There are all kinds of things to be done. Maybe you don't even know about some of these things. But we can find ways to serve because they are all around us. Another thing you can do is just that. Look around you today before you leave. You will probably find somebody who looks like they need a hug. Amen? I always like a hug. Even when things are going great, I like a hug. You can probably find somebody who needs a, a word of encouragement. You might find somebody who needs more than that, and whatever it is that's more, you might have to be able to offer them, whatever that might be. Something else we could do is we could begin our own ministries. If you take a look around, it might be that we get some snow here before too long. Are you ready with a shovel to go shovel somebody's sidewalk? And Lord willing, time goes on, there's going to be people with yards to mow. What about mowing grass for somebody who might have a hard time either mowing it themselves or, or paying to have it mowed? If we just look around, there are so many opportunities, and those opportunities are often for those people that we might consider the least of these. And if you do it for one who is the least of these, who are we actually doing it for? Doing it for the Lord. Serve, brethren. I... I don't quote other people much, and especially when there are some questions about their life. And I know that history tells a couple of different stories about John F. Kennedy. But he said something, and all of you have probably heard it. 
because it just rings so true and so solid and so parallel with what Jesus is saying. And some of you are probably saying, I know what you're going to say, Marty. Here it is. Ask not what your country can do for you. Rather, ask what you can do for your country. Now, I could see Jesus saying that. I can see Jesus in the crowd listening to John F. Kennedy saying, Amen. Preach on. Because that's the same sermon Jesus taught. How often did the apostles need to hear it? Well, <laughs> three times. Three times it's written down. Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 10, John chapter 13. He had to press home the issue of, of service. I'm no different than those guys. I need to keep hearing this lesson. I need to keep reading Matthew 25. One of the points that's made from Matthew 25, and do not take this where it's not supposed to go, but when Jesus showed us what happens in Matthew 25, he didn't say that those who come into the kingdom are those who attended the most church services. Don't take that where it's not supposed to go. But you know what point I'm trying to make. Jesus didn't say those who come into the kingdom are those who've drunk the most fruit of the vine and eaten the most crackers at the Lord's Supper. Don't take that where it's not supposed to go. Am I minimizing the Lord's Supper? Am I minimizing church assemblies? I'm just trying to say, you know where Jesus' heart was. And here's the thing about it. If we humble ourselves to serve as Jesus taught us to serve, it's going to be just like we studied this morning with David. We're going to be glad when they say to us, let's go to the house of the Lord. We're going to be glad when they say to us, let's go observe the Lord's Supper together. We're going to be glad to meet with the saints because we're going to be meeting with the saints who are servants at heart. If each one of us served ourselves, that would be, let's just say there's 350 people. Preacher count here this morning. We got somewhere under 1,000, I know. But let's just say there were 350 people here this morning and we all decide we're just going to serve ourselves. Well, that'd be 350 people with one servant each. But if we were 350 people and we said, I'm going to serve every member of this congregation when I find an opportunity, that means that I would have... 299 servants doing their best to see to mind. Now, which looks better to you? And I would be one of the 299 for everybody else. Jesus paints a picture for us. He shows us the way it ought to be. Are you willing to commit yourself to that? I think you are. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement because it may be that you have never put your... Self in the service of the Master. The servant of servants is also Lord of Lord and King of Kings. We're going to sing a song of encouragement because if you've never been baptized into Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity. We also want to give you the opportunity to ask for prayers or anything else for which you might have need because we are here to serve as God is here to serve. Let's stand and sing.